All right, so um, a couple of quick things today. What we're going to cover is the rest of chapter 11 and 12. So we'll get through DNA technology. Um, might take a little longer today, but we'll, we'll get through it. And then we'll also talk about uh, the exam a bit. So for those of you who showed up, feel free to ask your questions. But we'll uh, go through the uh, free response questions at the end of the exam. Okay. Um, what else? Also, be thinking about a science topic that interests you. Okay. Um, this is going to be what you're going to be writing your paper on and doing that brief presentation on. Okay. So just be ready to um, to start just start thinking about a, a, a science topic that interests you, whether it be uh, um, global warming or whether it be bacteria, infectious diseases, we can talk about viruses, it doesn't matter. Um, be thinking about your topic and I'll be asking you next week to provide that topic uh, to me, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll have an assignment uploaded and it'll just be telling, it'll be just a brief explanation of what that, um, that topic is going to be, okay? Also, I decided to, uh, have the exam on Monday. So you will have a lecture on Monday. We'll give you a free day just so we're going to be caught up, but you'll have uh, um, till you'll have that exam uploader Monday and you'll have uh, till the end of um, I think Tuesday, I guess. We saw so upload it Sunday and you'll have till the end of Tuesday to finish that. Okay. So you have Monday and Tuesday uh, of next of this next coming week to uh, get the exam done. Okay. Um, and then you also have a quiz tomorrow. All right, so you have a quiz. The quiz will, um, I believe it's gonna be on chapters nine and 10, but I will let you know when I upload the quiz. I'll write it in the little description, all right? It'll just say you have 15 minutes on chapters to take a quiz on chapters such and such, right? But so science project or science uh, uh, um, topic, be thinking of that and then, um, Again, exam on uh, Monday, and then you do have a quiz on Thursday, okay? And we just be keeping up with your lab material. I know um, some individuals have reached out. And they're having some problems with that material. Uh, let me know, okay? Um, and definitely meet in office hours if you're having issues, okay? So I do have office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I just sit here uh, in front of a, uh, the Zoom or in front of my, my camera waiting for someone to come in, okay? So if you have any issues, you have any problems, uh, let me know, we can, we can uh, uh, talk about them, okay? So, um, yeah, but all right, we'll get started because we do have a long lecture today and I don't wanna record for two hours. All right. We talked about the initiation of transcription, right? Transcription factor um, in a eukaryotic cell, protein that functions in initiating or regulating transcription. Um, this was the lactose and the lac operon, right? Lactose needs to be present in order to uh, remove that um, that uh, uh, block, uh, that protein that's blocking transcription, okay? Transcription factors bind to DNA or to the proteins that uh, bind to DNA. Enhancers, a eukaryotic DNA sequence that helps stimulate the transcription of a gene at some distance from it. Um, an enhancer functions by means of a transcription factor called an activator, which binds to uh, binds to it and then is uh, and then to rest of the transcription apparatus and then to the rest of the transcription apparatus. Excuse me. Silencer, a eukaryotic DNA sequence that inhibits the start of the gene, may act analogously to an enhancer binding a repressor, right? So we talked about that repressor with the lac operon. Lactose needs to be present in order for that repressor to be removed, okay? An activator, a protein that switches on a gene or a group of genes by binding to DNA. So um, I know we talked about the lac operon. I might upload an image of this for the exam and you should be able to determine uh, what needs to occur, right? And it, might, it will not have any of these names. Um, I would just, I'm gonna be asking you to identify this, okay? So, and explain it, right? You have uh, a repressor here. The repressor can be removed once lactose is present. Lactose is present and removes the repressor, right? Combine, change the structure of the protein, therefore removing the repressor, allowing for RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter region. 
once RNA polymerase comes in, it starts making an mRNA. The mRNA can then uh, uh, plug into a ribosome and make uh, the lactose enzyme, so lactase that can break down lactose, okay? So be able to understand that. And again, this has been bacteria. So um, this is much more simple than in eukaryotes, right? Where there's a, a lot of different factors. You have exons and introns. Exons, remember, leave the nucleus, whereas introns are spliced or cut out, okay? Uh, um, and then you have uh, various enhancers, silencers and activators in uh, eukaryotic cells, okay? So speaking of those exons and introns, as you remember, I talked about the, the variation that you can have in one gene, right? And that is kind of, this is, this is demonstrating what, um, what that, the, the purpose of having the exons and introns, right? So two different cells can use the same DNA, uh, DNA gene to synthesize different mRNAs and proteins, right? I told you that these exons can be flipped around uh, between uh, these, uh, these exons. Okay. So these, these parts or these exons are the, the parts of the mRNA that are going to be turned into or, uh, translated into protein. Okay. So, but these can be interchanged or flipped around or removed. Um, and they can create a different protein that way, right? So there can be multiple different types of manipulations done to the mRNA in order to create a very different protein. Think of just building blocks coming together, right? And these axons essentially are the building blocks. So when RNA is made from this DNA, right, we get uh, trans, uh, transcription occurring, right? Um, depending on what the protein that you need, three can end up becoming an intron and being cut out. So two and four can be placed together and you have a different mRNA after that, a different protein. Okay. And again, I think I mentioned this in terms of how antibodies are created. And this is how we can get variation uh, in our antibodies that can bind to different types of bacteria or fungi or viruses, right? So um, again, very, very important for the body in order to have this variation because then you can have one gene that can give you lots of variation, right? Uh, yeah, again, these mRNAs, which are just two of many possible outcomes, can then be translated into different types of proteins, all right? And again, introns and exons are only in eukaryotic organisms, so only in organisms with a nucleus, right? Whereas bacteria, very different. Uh, DNA to RNA, RNA is already plugging into a ribosome as uh, uh, RNA polymerase is working, okay? So everything happens very quickly in bacteria. Bacteria, much more simple and you lack this, uh, this ability here to have introns and exons being spliced uh, around or moved around. So signal transduction pathway. Oh, so, so this is a series of molecular changes that converts a signal received on a target, uh, target cell surface to a specific response inside the cell. So what does this mean? So cell signaling, right? You have a receptor being touched or being activated by uh, either a molecule or some sort of um, protein or environmental cue, right? So this can bind to that receptor. And your cells have many of these receptors. These receptors are just taken out of the cell. And if they come into contact with the signal molecule, they can induce this pathway, right? And this pathway can then induce uh, different proteins to be produced, right? So here you have the signal coming into contact with a receptor protein. Then you have, uh, uh, I guess, um, a signaling event done with these different relay proteins. Then the transcription factor is activated. The transcription factor will then bind to the DNA and recruit DNA polymerase and all of the DNA machinery, um, or I'm sorry, C uh, RNA polymerase, and then you have your mRNA. mRNA can be turned into that protein. Uh, once it finds a ribosome, okay? So this is the pathway, again, to get to the transcription factor activation with the RNA polymerase working to get your mRNA to eventually get your protein, okay? So there is a pathway that, uh, for this to occur. There's a pathway for this protein to be made to either counter or to, um, to address the signal molecule, whatever it might be, okay? So um, this can be from your own cells or this can be even from... Um, 
uh, pathogens in your body, right? So there's something in their cells that do have something called toll-like receptors. And these receptors can actually identify different types of infections that might be occurring in your body. So this is something specific for fungal sugars, bacterial sugars that they have on the outside of their cells. Um, and this signal molecule can be some, one of those things, right? It can be uh, a, a protein or a specific sugar found on the bacterium. And this can activate a pathway that will give you a protein that can protect you from the bacteria, the virus. Okay. And that's, that's very important, right? These cells need to have these pathways in order to protect themselves, or this can be some sort of metal, metabolic uh, um, path or metabolic um, byproduct that the, the cells need to take care of. And if that's the case, and this protein being produced might uh, clean up or take care of, uh, whatever this byproduct is that's that's uh, polluting the, the the cell's environment. Okay, so whatever this cell signal might be, it will determine whatever the protein that needs to uh, be produced to either combat or take care of that. Okay, so keep that in mind. Homeotic genes, so a master control gene that determines the identity of a body structure of a developing organism, presumably by controlling the development fate of groups of cells. In plants, uh, such genes are called organ identity genes. So homeotic genes, again, are going to be referring to the genes that are controlling the development, oops, the development of certain body structures, right? So this is how we can have a multicellular organism with all the same genetic information in all of the cells, yet I have a, a right and a left hand. I have a liver, I have kidney tissue, I have legs, right? You have these homeotic genes that determine the type of cells that will be present in different areas of your body, right? And this is the same for plants and uh, uh, multicellular organisms, okay? So a mutant fruit fly has an extra pair of legs growing out of its head as a result of a mutation in a homeotic master control gene, right? So these genes are very, very important to ensure that we come out of the womb uh, looking uh, uh, like a human, right? Otherwise, we can have very different variations or uh, abnormalities that might occur if we have mutations in these genes, okay? So homeotic genes control all of your cells and determine what your cells will be, whether it's a liver cell, an eye cell, uh, um, skin cell, it doesn't matter. These homeotic genes are going to ensure that the right cells are in the right place and they're expressing the right genes, okay, to be those types of cells. All right. So the genetic basis of cancer. All right. So this is very important. I will be asking you a, a free response question on this. Okay. So a few things you need to know about cancers, uh, oncogenes. So a cancer causing gene usually contributes to malignancy by abnorm abnormally exchanging the amount or activity of a growth factor made by a cell. So well, I'll just define this. So a growth factor, a protein secreted by certain body cells that stimulates other cells to divide. A tumor suppressing gene, a gene whose uh, product inhibits cell division, thereby preventing uncontrolled cell growth. So for an or order, in order for you to have uh, a cancer develop, a few things need to go wrong, right? First of all, you need to have a cell that's damaged in a certain way that allows for the cell to continuously divide. Okay, so um, I'm not a cancer expert by any means, but the, from what I understand about cancer is that um, uh, essentially what cancer is, is uncontrolled cell growth, right? So, and it's your own cells. So cancer can uh, be caused by a few different things in terms of what is causing that irregular growth, right? You can have a mutation in these oncogenes. Uh, you can have a mutation that causes your cells to uncontrollably divide. The mutation can be caused by a few different things, right? One of the main things that people tell you about, especially in California, is the sun. Ultraviolet radiation can damage DNA by causing thymine dimers, right? And these thymine dimers need to be repaired through excision repair, right? And what that means is the, that your DNA machinery comes in and clips the DNA and then adds new DNA there. And you could essentially have an event where you clip and add the wrong DNA and therefore causing a mutation in one of these genes that can cause cancer, right? Um, you can be infected by a virus, okay? So HPV, which is uh, essentially a wart virus, can cause cervical cancers, throat cancers, penile cancers, right? And this is, these cancers are essentially caused by that virus 
changing the cells in those areas of your body, allowing for them to overgrow and causing cancer. Okay. So cancer again is going to be that overgrowth of tissue, overgrowth of cells that's going to uh, uh, be stealing normal nutrients from the normal dividing cells or the cells in your body that you want to be around, right? Um, so for this to even to for this to continue and persist and occur, your immune system also needs to fail to recognize that those cells are over dividing, right? Um, many a times you can develop a cancer and your body will take care of it before it gets uh, past a few cells, right? There's natural killer cells and uh, uh, immune regulation in your body that can occur that prevents these cell cancer cells from growing to the point where they are metastasizing and causing issues in larger organ systems, okay? Um, so your body has a check system as well as um, uh, an immune uh, component that will protect against you having cancer. So a few things need to go wrong, right? Um, all right, so three ways that a prote uh, proteoncogene can become an oncogene, right? So a proteoncogene for a protein that simulates cell division, right? So there's either a mutation in, uh, within the gene, right? So uh, this mutation changes and this becomes an oncogene. So hyperactive growth can stimulate, okay? Um, here we have multiple copies of a gene. So normal growth stimulating protein in excess. So too much protein being created. Uh, mutation within a con uh, control region of DNA. So here you have, uh, this is a mutated promoter. So this is the, the, the area before the gene, right? Normal growth stimulating protein in excess, right? So normal growth of cells, but you have extreme amounts of these oncogenes being produced, these proteins that are gonna contribute to the overgrowth, okay? So again, these proteoncogenes are gonna be the things that are gonna be allowing for the overgrowth of the cells. So tumor suppressor gene, uh, again, normal growth inhibiting protein, cell division under control, okay? So these tumor suppressors are gonna prevent the overgrowth of these cells, uh, uh, hopefully preventing this cancer from occurring. So, um, so a tumor suppressor gene normally codes for a protein that inhibits cell growth and division. Such genes help prevent cancer tumors from arising or spreading. Um, and this is uh, very important, especially in larger mammals, okay? So, um, Animals, other animals can get cancers too, as many of you may know already. Um, an elephant has a lot of copies of this specific gene. Um, and I think they have like 10 times as many copies of tumor suppressor genes than we do. Um, and this is again, because that organism is more than 10 times our size, okay? So there is more potential there. The more tissue you have, the more cells you have, the more potential you have for cancer, okay? So, um, and cancer is quite rare uh, in elephants uh, at a certain age. So, uh, and again, because of these tumor suppressor genes, um, you don't really need to know that, but I'm just giving you a little fun fact about elephants. So uh, mutated tumor suppressor gene. So if the tumor suppression gene is defective, you have a defective non-functional protein, cell division not under control. So uncontrolled cell growth is cancer, right? When a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene makes its proteins defective, cells that are usually under control of the normal protein may divide excessively forming a tumor. This tumor may then metastasize or break off these cells into different parts of the body, such as a lymph node or other organ systems, which can further wreak havoc on the body, okay? All right, any questions about cancer before we move to chapter 12? No, okay. So DNA technology, oops, I do have a question. Nope, cool, thank you, Rhonda. All right, so genetic engineering. So there's a few uh, new fields in uh, genetic engineering. I'm surprised the book was talking about them. And uh, I was like, all right, well, we'll, we'll talk about them. So there's biotechnology, the manipulation of living organisms to, form, to perform useful tasks. We have genetically modified organisms. So these are organisms that, uh, an organism that has acquired one or more genes by artificial means. If the gene is from another organism, typically another species, the recombinant organism is also known as a transgenic organism. 
Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, okay? Transgenic organisms, an organism that contains genes from another organism, typically of another species, genetic engineering, the direct manipulation of genes for practical purposes, okay? So genetic engineering is huge. Um, during my graduate project, I performed a few different, uh, um, I guess, genetic engineering uh, based uh, um, experiments, right? I actually went in and, well, I didn't go in physically to manipulate genetic information. I utilized a virus to go in and uh, create a mutant in my bacterium that I was interested in, right? It was a targeted mutation. So um, DNA technology, when I first started learning about biology in high school and, and, and in college was um, DNA technology was a big thing. Okay, understanding and manipulating genetics was huge. Okay, um, and it, it's kind of, it's a new field, and we're learning about genetics in a big way now. We're starting to map whole genomes, and we're starting to understand uh, what roles these genetics play uh, in in you know uh, life and survival, and then in the health of different organisms and in our crops. So this is a new field. Um, it's very expansive and it's very um what it's it's kind of wide open in terms of of what we're able to do in, in terms of investments right um this is kind of the future of what um uh, biology is right being able to uh, uh profit and create these uh, uh new types of uh, technologies and uh and benefit from it okay so here we have researchers produce glowing fish by transferring a gene for a fluorescent protein or uh, originally obtained from jellies or jellyfish, okay? So here we have fluorescent fish uh, given uh, the ad added gene from a jellyfish, okay? So there's a lot of ethical question questions that are raised from this as well, uh, which we'll get into later. But again, um, new field, scientists around the world are doing some weird things, uh, especially in Korea and, um, and some of the, the countries uh, um, more east of us, right? There are a little bit of um, different, uh, maybe questionable things that are occurring, such as mixing different types of, of genetics and different types of organisms, right? Um, so recombinant DNA techniques. So plasmids, a plasmid is a small ring of self-replicating DNA separate from the larger chromosomes. Plasmids are most frequently derived from bacteria. So I worked with plasmids a great deal. Uh, again, they're just circular pieces of DNA that can be given to bacteria. And this is one of the ways that a bacteria can share DNA naturally, right? This is how some bacteria can be more resistant to antibiotics and others because they were able to share their DNA, okay? Um, and they, they're able to share this DNA through plasmids. These are remnants of virus DNA as well as remnants of old uh, pieces of DNA from maybe dead or um, dead or genetically modified uh, uh, bacteria. Okay, so DNA cloning: the production of many identical copies of a specific segment of DNA, which can then be used to be put into a plasmid, and vice versa. Right? We can have uh, DNA cloning by a plasmid. Excuse me. Um, depending on what we're doing. Okay. So bacteria plasmids. So you see here, this is a bacterial chromosome, right? This is all one piece of DNA and a plasmid is a small itty bitty little circular piece of DNA here, okay? So this may only give you, provide the bacteria with one specific uh, uh, protein that may be useful, okay? Um, typically these uh, plasmids will uh, have an enzyme that's able to break down toxic waste or the ability to stop an antibiotic from working on this uh, bacterial organism, okay? So uh, typically you do have antibiotic resistance genes found on these plasmids, okay? Um, Acinetobacter baumani is kind of the uh, promiscuous bacteria in the hospital setting. Acinetobacter can actually share its plasmids readily with other microorganisms, which can be a problem, right? If you get an infection with Acinetobacter, um, it can transfer uh, these uh, uh, antibiotic resistance plasmids to normal flora on your body. So if you ever get an infection, they your organisms present on your body naturally may be resistant 
to the antibiotics that you're going to be taking to prevent or stop that infection. Okay. Which is quite scary, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be infected with something that you can't treat. Right. And we're moving towards that in the hospital setting. Uh, sometimes you get patients in there um, and you don't know if the antibiotic is going to work and you either pray and hope that eventually they recover or they may succumb to the, the infection. Okay. All right, so recombinant DNA technology to make useful products. There's a lot of different things that, um, that we can use uh, or that we have now for recombinant DNA technology. So one of the biggest breakthroughs uh, um, in recombinant DNA technology is insulin. Okay, So if you didn't know, insulin is actually um, made uh, in eukaryotic cells. Okay, So what, uh, what we have done is that we actually have isolated uh, mRNAs from the pancreas and through the uh, ad advent of reverse transcriptase, we're able to convert that uh, mRNA back into DNA and make a lot of copies, right? We're able to make what is called uh, DNA cloning or DNA copies of that specific gene, okay? We're able to put this back into a plasmid, right? Gene of interest. So this could be the gene uh, that we have that codes for insulin. We put it in a plasmid. We're able to place it in a recombinant bacterium. Um, and then this recombinant bacterium can then divide and survive. Um, and it also can produce the, the insulin that we need, okay? Because it has this plasmid. We can induce this plasmid to produce a protein. And this protein can be anything, oh, excuse me, anything from insulin to uh, uh, genes used to break down toxic waste, genes used in uh, resistance uh, in, in plants, or a protein used to dissolve blood clots in a heart attack, right? But I mean, the big one that we see all the time as a case study is insulin. Insulin is huge, right? Long acting, uh, short acting insulin, right? All of these insulins can be produced inside of your E. coli cell, which then can be harvested, placed in a bottle, and sold to individuals that do have uh, um, uh, a diabetes uh, type one or type two, okay, um, or insulin dependent diabetes rather, um, and this is big, right? Uh, this also provides some ethical issues too. Uh, this is quite a cheap method in terms of how much uh, this might cost the cost the consumer. This is fairly cheap to make, right? Uh, e. coli is very easily grown. E. coli is very easily changed or manipulated genetically. Um, and this process, once it's down to a science, once you have your, uh, your um, uh, machinery and your holding tanks and your centrifuges set up, this process can be fairly cheap for that company to produce. But you still have skyrocketing drug prices uh, for insulin, right? There have been a lot of cases made against insulin being too expensive for individuals that are insulin dependent, right? Um, and there are ethical issues. Do we protect the, con uh, the consumer who needs the insulin to survive? Or do we protect our companies who would like an incentive to continue to have these medical breakthroughs, right, if they get paid for it? Otherwise, um, you know, we subsidize this or we, we uh, provide a law that inhibits them from earning a certain amount of money based on the profit of, uh, of these certain uh, drugs. Uh, do we prevent them from creating these drugs, right? And this is a big thing with, uh, with uh, um, what is it, Foster? Not Foster. Um, that was the act created, sorry, of where we have really rare genetic diseases that require very, 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 very expensive drugs to treat, yet only one in a million uh, uh, children are affected by certain diseases, one of them being cystic fibrosis, right? Um, the incentive for those companies to find a cure, to find better medications is provided through the government, right? The government says, hey, uh, um, this foster disease needs a drug. It needs a drug to help these children survive because these children aren't surviving past the age of, I believe it was 13 to 14 uh, when cystic fibrosis didn't have a lot of uh, uh, people working on medications for those individuals with cystic fibrosis. People, children didn't live past a certain age typically the ages of pubescence, right? So um, subsidizing or allowing their, or providing some sort of a revenue for these companies that look for these medications um, is, is important as well, okay? All right, so gene editing. So this is Cas9. 
uh, a technique for editing genes in living cells involving a bacterial protein called Cas9. So this is, I believe, in Streptococcus uh, strains. Um, so this is associated with a guide mRNA complementary to a gene uh, sequence of interest, right? So this is how bacteria can edit uh, their own genome. And why would you edit your own genome? This, this doesn't almost like, this almost doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you make a protein that can come in? Um, there's a, a, pro, a Cas9 protein mixed with an RNA that can come in and clip and remove DNA uh, in your genome, right? This is a bacterial protein. Well, bacteria are a little bit different than us in terms of uh, we have a nucleus, we have an envelope, right? For the nucleus. And um, typically when we have a viral infection, we have a lot of different cells that are recruited uh, to the area in order to combat that viral infection. Some of your cells will die no matter what, but your cells will come together to fight off this viral infection. Well, bacteria aren't as lucky, right? Bacteria are single celled organisms uh, that require um, them to protect themselves from whatever viral infection that may occur. Cas9 is a protein RNA uh, mixture that identifies a viral geno genomic DNA inside of the genome and clips it out and removes it, right? But doesn't want that genome to be present there. So it's very similar. Uh, uh, bacterial phages have a lysogenic or lytic cycle. The lysogenic cycle of a virus and a bacterium means that this bacterium will infect this cell, this, this bacterial cell, and then it will, it will incorporate its genome inside of its own genome. Therefore, that when that cell bacterium divides, it'll have multiple copies of that virus inside, right? If that gene or that viral or those viral genetics get turned on, that cell will die, okay? So this helps uh, to cut out or clip out any viral genome, genomic information inside that bacterium. But um, this is also very important too because we can utilize this protein in uh, a eukaryotic cell. You can uh, edit genomic information that's already present inside of this uh, of your of your genes, right? You can change the genes without having to have a child or give birth to a new a new uh, a generation, right? Just like Mendelian genetics, right? In order to to curb or uh, have a desired trait, you need to breed and have more children, right? But this kind of prevents that. This allows you to uh, edit the genomic information using a protein, which is huge, right? So Cas9 RNA complex binds to the target DNA sequence, uh, guide RNA complementary sequence, so this can bind to the DNA, right? Cas9 protein cuts DNA, resulting cut uh, of target gene, right? So you have a normal copy of gene, then you have a cut gene. A normal copy serves as a template to repair enzymes, correct a nucleotide sequence, right? So this can then come together um, and reform after the genomic information has been clipped or removed, okay? So this is editing genomic information real time. When, and and the, the potential for this um, is huge, right? If someone has a faulty gene or let's say a uh, um, a, a gene that may be cancerous in the future, you can go in and actually clip or edit out that genomic information that's found on those cells, right? Um, this is still very preliminary from what I've read. Uh, you cannot just inject uh, uh, bacterial proteins inside of a cell. Um, this will raise an immune response, which is not good. You can have an allergic reaction. But from what I understood is that they have started editing uh, mouse genomes and either uh, fixing a faulty gene or adding a new gene to that mouse in order to allow them to survive or uh, not have that uh, uh, negative side or negative um, mutation anymore, okay? Which is very big. If they're doing it in mice, uh, humans may not be too far off on, um, on that ability, okay? So... Uh, very, very good, very interesting uh, new research on Cas9, okay? So human insulin is produced by genetically modified bacteria, E. coli. So uh, again, very important here. I talked a little bit about insulin earlier. Excuse me. 
again, this is made from a plasma that's inserted inside E. coli. E. coli will produce the insulin um, uh, through induction of that plasma. So it uh, has that gene. It's specifically making the, the human insulin protein again, and then it can be harvested uh, through centrifuge. And so they just spin it down and they collect that liquid that is going to be insulin, that protein, right? So here you have the machinery uh, and the, the, the giant vats that house the E. coli, which then can har you can harvest the insulin from. Okay, so there has been a genetically modified goat. Uh, the genetically modified goat actually has spider DNA, right? And um, interesting enough, when the goat produces milk, you can harvest spider silk from the milk uh, uh, during the milking process, right? Which is crazy. You have a spider goat, right? You have a goat that's producing uh, um, spider web in the milk, spider protein web inside of the milk. And if you didn't know, um, spider, spider web is one of the most strongest and lightest substances on earth, right? So a uh, goat produces a lot of milk. Um, this can be an economic, uh, 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 you can exploit this economically too, right? You can say, hey, we got all the spider silk protein. We can make all these new and cool uh, um, fabrics from the spider silk, given that it's so light and so strong, right? Um, so very interesting. There's a lot of ethic, ethical concerns behind this as well. All right, genetically modified potatoes. Uh, again, this, uh, these potatoes have a cholera gene from bacterium. So um, uh, Vibrio cholera, um, uh, can, uh, can provide a level of uh, protection against uh, um, the, the disease cholera, right? So these potatoes will, will not allow for the growth of, of this pathogenic strain of organism, right? Uh, so corn, corn plants in the field have a bacterial gene that helps prevent infestation of Euro European corn uh, uh, borer, okay? So a uh, bad uh, worm that's gonna come in and infect the corn, right? Uh, a genetically modified corn has a protection for, provided by a bacteria, okay? And this will um, help protect against the infestation, right? Uh, we've seen genetically modified corn as well with uh, um, the nitrogen fixation. There are, there's also uh, different genes that have been added to corn um, from other plants that allow them to survive in differential environments, whether it be uh, less water, uh, higher salt concentration to the soil, right? There's a lot of different things that we've done with corn in order to enhance its growth. All right, so we also have golden rice too. Yellow grain shown left, analogous to ordinary rice has been genetically modified to produce high levels of beta carotene, right? So in certain areas of the world, um, there is a lot, uh, there's a lack of beta carotene in, um, in, as a nutrient, right? And this is why you have um, certain types of blindness only found in third world countries where they lack certain nutrients, right? Or a goiter where you lack iodine. Um, a molecule that a body converts into vitamin A, transgenic uh, castle right, a starch root crop that serves as a main food source and nearly a billion people has been modified to produce extra nutrients, right? And these are areas where uh, um, they may have, uh, they may lack folate, they may like, uh, they may like iron, uh, iodine, things like that, right? Whereas in the United States, we, we typically don't have, uh, um, we don't lack a lot of these nutrients because we supplement them, right? We talked about that earlier about our food, right? We have folate uh, uh, fortified uh, grains. We have iron in our cereal, right? We have those luxuries, whereas other parts of the world don't, right? So they have these, uh, they provide, a, provide these individual, uh, individuals with a genetically modified crop that allows them to uh, gain their vitamin A or their beta carotenes or uh, various nutrients, okay? Human gene therapy. Right, a recombinant DNA procedure intended to treat disease by altering an afflicted person's genes. Right, so this is going to be treating individuals that have the disease uh, that may or may not have a cure, um, and or a drug that can help them, um, especially with those uh, the diseases that affect multi-organ systems and um, that there's no cure for that typically have a terminal outcome, right? And one of those diseases is cystic fibrosis, right? So cystic fibrosis is a lung disease. Uh, you're born with it. Uh, and many children 
uh, before the advent of all these new drugs and medications would die before the age of pubescence, right? Or even in, during, uh, uh, around the time of birth, right? You, as a newborn. Uh, very difficult to clear mucus. You get infections in the lung and you eventually die. Okay, so one approach to human gene therapy is actually uh, using a viral vector. Um, and you can do this uh, by uh, inserting a normal human gene inside of an RNA or a DNA virus. That virus can be uh, um, uh, infected into the human with this new genetic information, this uh, good uh, copy of the gene. This virus can infect the cell. Uh, if it's a provirus, um, the provirus can then insert its genetic information into your chromosome, hopefully allowing for uh, a, a good gene to be inserted and therefore you have the gene of interest placed inside of your, your chromosome that can then be transcribed and utilized in your body, right? Uh, we are a long way off from this. There is a few setbacks um, in the Jesse Ginslinger uh, case where an individual had, um, I believe it was a form of PKU or some sort of uh, um, issue processing a certain amino acid, right? Um, and this individual was infected with, with uh, uh, viral vectors um, and he was transfused with them. So hopefully they were going to provide this, this genetic code that was going to prevent him from having this disease anymore. Well, he had, an alert, he had a reaction to the virus being pumped into his body and he ended up dying. Okay? So there's a lot of uh, red tape around this type of, these types of studies now where um, you know, drug companies need to be very, very sure that they're not going to kill anybody. Because it can be very tricky working with viruses and a human immune system, right? These viruses are technically uh, 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 trespassers or uh, invaders in our body and our immune system can combat or uh, uh, wants to fight them off rather than allowing them to insert the genetic information inside of our cell, right? That can be an issue. Our body can see that as an issue, okay? There's a lot of, uh, you know, discoveries or a lot of new research that needs to be produced in order to, for this to actually be feasible and work, okay? So PCR, polymerase chain reaction, this is what your lab will be on today. All right, so polymerase chain reaction, a technique used to obtain many copies of, of a DNA molecule or many copies uh, of part of a DNA, DNA molecule or many copies, oh, I just repeated that, sorry, it's a typo. A small amount of DNA mixed with an enzyme DNA polymerase a DNA nucleotides and a few other ingredients replicates repeatedly in a test tube. Okay. Um, I'm going to change that one. So essentially what is occurring is you're having, or you're providing all the materials necessary to copy DNA inside of a vat, right? Um, and this vat will be heated and cooled and cycled back and forth in order to make multiple copies of a DNA, uh, of a DNA strand. Okay. Um, so here you have an example of what occurs in PCR. You have, again, all of the ingredients needed to copy DNA, the enzymes, the nucleotides, uh, the primers, right? You do need a primer, right? But in this case, we'll use a DNA primer, okay? So you have primers for either side of the DNA strands, um, and then you can copy these strands, um, and you'll have an exponential growth after a few cycles of the PCR machine, excuse me. The polymerase chain reaction PCR is a method for making many copies of a segment of DNA. Each round of PCR performed on a thermocycler shown at top, doubles the total quantity of DNA, okay? Um, again, very important. We utilize this all the time in the clinical setting, right? This, many copies of a target gene can be made, and then, many of the, and then these many copies can ide be identified, right? Oh, this is, a certain bacterial gene um, that may be bad. If we identify that gene and we make a bunch of copies, we can, we can, we can have a detector on a machine that can pick up uh, the copies being made, okay? Through a probe or whatever, okay? So DNA, uh, PCR, very, very important, okay? So we also have short tandem repeats or STR sites. The scattered throughout the genome, STR sites contain tandem repeats of four nucleotide sequences. The number of repetitions of each site can vary from individual to individual. In this figure, both DNA samples have the same number of repeats, seven, 
at, at the first STR site, but different numbers, uh, eight versus 12 at the second, okay? So these tandem repeats are used in gene aid technology in order to identify individuals, right? So this is essentially a paternity test, okay? These tandem repeats are gonna be uh, used to uh, either to identify a person for a paternity test or a crime scene, okay? Um, and again, uh, these are conserved, but uh, pieces of DNA that are specific to each individual, okay? But you can definitely tell how related someone is based on these, on these uh, sites, right? And this has been utilized for uh, quite a while since um, PCR has been invented. And what you do is you make multiple copies or you make very specific uh, primers that are gonna start copying the genomes from each other side, okay? Um, and you can see this uh, uh, in uh, crime labs as well as uh, paternity, paternity testing uh, laboratories, right? So again, you have a mixture of fragments of DNA. Um, you've performed your PCR already, um, and then you can load them into an acrylic or a, a, a auger, agarose gel, okay? And what you have is electrophoresis, right? So DNA has a, a negative charge, so DNA will travel towards a more positive end of the electrode, right? Through attraction, attractive forces, right? And you can see who committed the murder or who is the father, right? So here you have one that clearly does not match, and here you have these two that do match. So you can have a suspect's uh, a DNA uh, amplified, uh, you have multiple uh, uh, segments that are amplified and cut, and then you have multiple segments amplified and cut for different suspects, and then you can identify the one that is most similar um, shown here, right? So this middle band and this one on the end is the most similar, right? Um, so again, this figure shows the bands that would result from the electrophoresis of the, the tandem repeat sites illustrated in figure 12.14. Notice that one of the bands from the crime scene does not match one of the bands from the suspect's DNA, okay? Uh, again, this can occur, uh, but for the most part, if you have multiple lines of, of uh, uh, lining up, then you know that the DNA is relatively similar, right? Whereas if you have another segment that looks different or, um, may be changed in a certain way, it, it may or may not be that individual, okay? But there's different ways that you can do this um, and you can see very high similarity or very low similarity, depending on what types of techniques you're using, okay? So uh, viruses and other non-cellular infectious agents, so back to chapter 10. So viruses are a microscopic particle capable of infecting cells of living organism and inserting its genetic material. Viruses have a very simple structure and are genetically not considered to be alive because they do not display all the characteristics associated with life, right? They don't have a metabolism, they don't have ribosomes, they lack the ability uh, um, to, uh, to have uh, those types of metabolic pathways that cells do have, okay? So the adenovirus, so this actually, adeno-associated virus actually causes pink eye, but this adenovirus is common in humans in the respiratory tract. Right, so it's a DNA enclosed protein shaped like a 20 sided uh, polyhedron. Uh, uh, so, this is a computer generated mo molecule, approximately 500,000 uh, times the actual size. At each corner of the, the polyhedron is a protein spike. These protein spikes are used to bind to cells. Okay, so this will actually bind to the epithelial tissue in the lung or in the tissues of the upper respiratory tract uh, that will eventually infect and uh, dump the DNA molecule inside of those cells, right? So phage, phage uh, viruses actually affect bacteria. Uh, this is what I was referring to with the lytic and lysogenic cycle, okay? Sometimes um, the phage will inject the DNA and it will incorporate the DNA inside of the bacterial genome shown here, right? This is phage DNA. Um, the lysogenic cycle uh, can be uh, exploited by the virus later on, right? If that bacteria continually divides, you continually make more copies of the viral genome as well, then you're gonna have more viruses later on. Or the virus takes a gamble and the bacteria produces something called restriction enzymes or strep produces that Cas9, right? And it can edit the G DNA with the virus there, okay? 
So if it edits the DNA, it cuts the DNA out, removes it, and therefore you have uh, um, the virus being removed. So you do have a lytic and lysogenic cycle. This kind of shows you what's occurring in terms of the lytic and lysogenic cycle, right? If a phage or a, bact or a bacterial phage or this virus infects a bacterium, right, and injects the DNA, one or two things can happen. It can go into the, lys uh, the lytic cycle, which makes copies of the virus, just like what, what would happen in your body with the flu, right? Makes copies of the virus, the cells break open and release more virus, okay? These viruses can then go and infect more bacteria, right? Or you can go into the lysogenic cycle, right? So it's injected, uh, uh, the DNA then incorporates itself into the D genome. Now you have a prophage or a provirus, right? Then after the cell divides, you have multiple copies of this virus inside of multiple bacteria. So you have more potential of producing much more of these phage viruses. But again, the virus is taking a risk because bacteria do have genetic or gene editing proteins such as restriction enzymes. And we saw in strep there is uh, um, Cas9, right? So Cas9 can identify this or the restriction enzymes can identify this and clip the viral genome out, therefore preventing uh, the, uh, the, the virus from causing an active infection, okay? Influenza virus, so this is a virus that infects humans, right? There is multiple segments of RNA, okay? So eight separate molecules of RNA can be shared between other viruses, right? You have all these spike proteins. And the interesting thing about this virus, it also has an RNA genome, right? So there's no DNA here, okay? So this is all RNA, right? So it can enter a cell, produce the, or dump the RNA into the cell, you have the encoding, RNA gets converted into uh, a few different things. So either it can go into protein synthesis or RNA synthesis, right? So a new viral genome is created from a template strand, uh, and then you have the production and assembly of that virus, okay? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about viruses later when we get into uh, pathogenic organisms. Um, but again, viruses are very important, especially now we've been talking about the coronavirus, so we'll definitely be talking about uh, um, viruses later. I just wanted to mention viruses here because of the RNA genome, right? We talk, we're talking about genetics, certain organisms, certain uh, infectious molecules, because this technically is an organism, produce different genomes or have different genomes, okay? Here's a, a protein spike. This is an electromicrogram of a virus. And then you have that envelope, right? These protein spikes are the things that are gonna be binding to cells in order to gain entry to that cell. All right, um, you know, we'll end it here because I think I wanna go over the exam. All right, yeah, so we'll spend the rest of the time going over the exam. I'm not gonna cover, I was gonna go into the, the, uh, the DNA tech, but for the most part, that lab is gonna be fairly simple. It's gonna be going through um, what we just covered in a way. Uh, it'll talk about, it's gonna go through this process. It'll talk about uh, DNA polymerase um, and how you make copies in PCR and then how you're gonna identify those copies through uh, gel electrophoresis. What occurs with the DNA uh, in gel electrophoresis, right? Uh, so you have uh, uh, electrode or power source, DNA is loaded into these wells. Um, this electrical current is provided through uh, um, the power source. Uh, you have one anode and one cathode that cathode is gonna be pulling the DNA because DNA is, is negatively charged due to the phosphate backbone. And then that DNA will travel through the gel separating out into larger and smaller fragments, okay? So uh, band of the longest or uh, slowest fragments and then band of the fastest fragments that can move past in that gel, okay? So um, yeah, it'll, it'll walk you through those steps, but essentially that's what you're doing for that lab, okay? All right, so let's go to the exam. All right, uh, preview. Okay, so we'll go, uh, the multiple choice we won't really talk about. All right. 
So single blind versus double blind experiment, right? Single blind, only the uh, researcher or the test subject is going to be blind. A double blind, both researcher and test subject are blind. That's all you needed to say there, okay? What is the difference between an ionic bond versus a covalent bond? So ionic bonds, there is a, a donation of an electron to one, um, one element or one molecule or one atom, whereas uh, there is a sharing of electrons in a covalent bond. They do not separate into their separate charges, right? Because sodium chloride, sodium gives away an electron to chlorine. Chlorine becomes more negative. Sodium becomes more positive due to that donation and receiving of the electron. Whereas a covalent bond between an oxygen and hydrogen, the bonds are evenly shared between one electron, okay? Uh, and then you could say well, covalence more, typically more strong. Ionic bonds can be separated by hydrogen bonding in water, okay? Different things like that, but all I needed was that. Uh, ionic bonds, donation of electron. Covalent bonds, a sharing of electron, okay? Please explain why it is better to, uh, oops, down in the ocean, drown in the ocean. I'm so sorry. I'll see if anyone got confused. Rather than in fresh water, hint, think salt, right? So here you should have explained uh, that in the ocean, you are in a hypertonic environment. Therefore, the shells shrink, uh, causing them to perform plasmolysis, right? So the cell will, will shrink and not pop. In fresh water in a swimming pool, your cells and your lungs will rupture. Therefore, you lose the tissue as well, um, which may uh, provide to be more lethal um, in that environment. Okay, so think of solute concentrations here. Ocean being salty shrinks the cell. Fresh water uh, can cause apoptosis of that cell. All right, if, almost, as, if osmosis uh, is possible with the membrane shown separating the two different solutions, where would water flow and why? So it'll flow towards the right um, and, and because of the uh, hypertonic solution here, right? Um, these particles, again, do not pass. This water will fill up here and it'll move towards the side and it'll be at a higher level, okay? So this image is provided in your book and you should have understood the concept of hypertonic versus hypotonic solution, okay? Uh, so 10 point, please explain how monomers are linked together uh, to make polymers. Please list three polysaccharides we talked about in a lecture that are made from glucose. Also, please tell me the uses of each of these polysaccharides. So, so monomers are linked together by uh, dehydration synthesis reactions. So that's one. Uh, please list three polysaccharides. We have starch, glycogen, and cellulose, okay? Made of glucose. Starch in plants, storage molecule. Glycogen, storage molecule in humans and animals. And then, um, uh, 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 Cellulose is a, a, a structural and protective molecule in plants, okay, or protective structure in plants, right? It's their cell wall. And if you just said it makes the cell wall of, of plant cells, that's fine as well. Um, and that's it, okay, it's 10 points right there. So please provide three special characteristics of water. Please include one about ice and explain why each property is beneficial to biochemical systems. All right, so one, water is a good solvent. Uh, the other, uh, there's hydrogen bonding um, that can absorb heat or give off heat. And then uh, three, due to the hydrogen bonding, ice floats. So the lattice structure of solid ice is actually less dense than liquid ice, allowing for ice to float, okay? Um, and those are the three big ones that I wanted you to touch on, right? Ice floats, it's a good solvent, so it can break down ionic molecules there uh, and form aqueous solutions. And it's polar. Right, and the third is going to be that um, the hydrogen bonds holding in heat. So you have thermal regulation of coastlines or big bodies of water, right? This is why the coast is never too hot or never too cold, okay? You could also talk about um, evaporative cooling. You could also talk about, uh, I think I gave the example of the orange trees and, and heating, right? This is why you spray and you want that water to freeze because when it freezes, it gives off energy, preventing the, the oranges from freezing, right? Um, yeah, that's it. Um, any questions? I know there's only one person here. So those of you who are watching the recording, uh, please, um, again, check your, 
um, start thinking of, of your uh, uh, topic for, for, the, uh, for the paper and the presentation, okay? So any science topic you want. Uh, I recommend, you know, if you wanna do, I don't want, I mean, I guess everyone can do something about a virus. I know that the coronavirus is kind of the popular thing right now. But, um, you know, my specialty is in microbiology. If you wanna pick a different disease, it's more than, you're more than welcome to do that. You can do cancer. You can talk about global warming. You can talk about uh, deforestation. I, it, it doesn't matter. Any science topic is more than, more than welcome, okay? So uh, I prefer to be about biology, but if it spills into chemistry or genetics or things like that, I don't, I mean, I guess it's all in biology genetics too, but if it spills into chemistry a little bit or physics, I don't mind, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll provide you a website. I think I'll send a website to see if, uh, if uh, this helps out, but it's uh, IFL Science. It's, you can go on Google, look up IFL Science, and it kind of shows you uh, different relevant topics. Uh, and they upload articles daily, typically. And they're just small little articles that you can read fairly quickly, um, and they can give you an idea. So uh, IFL Science. Um, yeah. All right.